need you to tell me your name and the date of your birth, the country, the town where you were raised. I was born in a city called Riga, which was the capital of Latvia. Latvia was one of the three countries of the Baltic states. There were Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. When I was born in Riga, Latvia, at the 11th of August, 1930, my name is Roman, R-O-M-A-N, Lubetsky, spelled L-U-B-E-T-Z-K-Y. And then, you, you only lived in Riga for a short time, as I recall. Well, my uh, parents, uh, when my mother was going to have a baby, decided we want, they wanted to go to Riga because my mother's mother was living there, and at that time, she was a very young woman. It was easier for her to have a child uh, where her mother was to help her at the beginning. And after I was born in Riga, I stayed there for four years. And when I was four years old, we went back to Lithuania where my father had some business established. And my father was a Lithuanian. And we went to the city of Kovno, which was at that time the capital of uh, Lithuania. Uh, I say at that time the capital because the real capital as it was established after the Second World War, it was Vilnius. But as there was a big fight between the Lithuanians and the Polish people, who was the owner of the city of Vilnius, at that time Vilnius was in the hands of Poland, so the provisional capital was Kovno or Kaunas. And that's where we were living uh, till 1940, when the Russians came into Lithuania and decided that Lithuania is going to be part of Soviet Russia. So uh, that was part of Russia, same as Latvia and, and uh, Estonia. And in uh, 1941, when the Germans invaded Lithuania, and the Russians went in to Russia and uh, let the Germans invade Lithuania, uh, we were captured right there. Uh, and this is where, for us, the world uh, war second started. Okay. When bef w when you were growing up, or between, after you'd moved back to uh, Riga, I mean, uh, back to Kovno, um, you were, your family was yourself, your mother and father, and... A brother of mine. A brother. And five how? years older than me. Uh -huh. And of course we had uncles, and, and uh, I had many cousins uh, living in Lithuania, also, and many of them living in uh, Latvia. So we had a group of people, and in the Lithuanian village I had my grandmother and grandfather and another aunt living. So we, were heading, we had our, our family scattered through Lithuania and uh, Latvia at that time, uh, in the largest percentage. We also had some family at that time in Israel, some family in Mexico, but uh, mainly all of them were in Lithuania and Latvia. Mm -hmm. and, and although they were scattered, was it very far to go visit? Did you have a lot of visit back and forth? Uh, the distances in Lithuania, which is a country of two and a half million inhabitants, was not very big. Lithuania was a very small little country. So was Latvia and so was Estonia. Actually, these are countries which probably would fit into uh, a little state in the United States, all of them, the three of them together. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about 30 kilometers or 40 kilometers or 25 miles, by train, it's nothing, and by horse, it could be uh, maybe uh, three, four hours. But the distances were small, and it was not very difficult to travel. Mm -hmm. I would visit occasionally my grandmother and grandfather in the city of Alitus, which was probably about four hours by bus from Kovno. And in a modern bus today, it probably be, would be probably 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. What was life like in your city of Kovno before, before the invasion by Russia? I would say that the life was uh, very special there because there was a very important Jewish community. Lithuania had a very uh, important development in the Jewish culture, or a very important role, let me say so, in the Jewish culture. And in the village, type of Jews who lived in Lithuania, uh, the religion was practiced very, very seriously. 
There are many places where the Jewish children would go to study their first uh, and most important uh, approaches towards knowledge were usually made in, uh, in haters. And there was, of course, another group of people who was living in the capital. Who, there was a Jewish, uh, very good Jewish school, actually schools. One of them was Real Gymnasia, the other one was uh, Schwabe Gymnasium, uh, where very, very good preparation was given to children. And as I said before, in Slabotke, which was around uh, the city of Kovno, not exactly in the center, but a little further out, uh, very important Jewish studies in yeshivas were uh, functioning. The Jewish people there were profoundly uh, religious, very honest, very good people. And uh, from this yeshiva in Slabotke, uh, the most important yeshivas were founded in the United States, like in New York, and in also in, in Jerusalem. So the people recognized at that time that the Jewish culture was emanating very, very strongly from Lithuania, very strongly also from the city of Vilnius, which at that time was under Polish occupation, but also very, very strongly from Slabotke in the city of Kovno, which was under Lithuanian occupation. And as Lithuania became independent in 1918 after the First World War, there was a lot of uh, feeling towards being independent and trying to be a democracy and uh, the Jewish people had some uh, important here and say in the government positions and they were doing uh, very, very progressive work. There were some of them even uh, were very happy to be able to participate in the movements uh, like the Frontkämpfer, which are the, the fighters in the front, which were fighting for the independence of Lithuania so many of them were decorated by the Lithuanian president as people who have been doing all they could for the progress of Lithuania. My father was among those people also. He was even the president of the, of the Frontkämpfer Verband, which was the, the association of the fighters for the Lithuanian independence and democracy. And uh, the city had important cultural points. It was a European city. There was an op opera active. There was a theater, important uh, ballet performances. And there was, even in a city as small as, as Kovno, uh, there was important things happening there. How big was Kovno at the time? Kovno had around 150 to 200,000 people, which was not a small city uh, in European standards in 1940. Mm -hmm. It was fairly a good size city. Now, your dad was active, you say, in, in gaining, helping gain Lithuanian independence. Yes. What did he do to make a living for you and your family? Okay, well, he was in the Lithuanian army when he was a young boy, uh, when there was the fight of independence, when Lithuania wanted to be uh, independent. Mm -hmm. And he was a businessman, after all that finished, he was a businessman. He had uh, reached a good level of, uh, of uh, business uh, knowledge. He was uh, having a fact. He had a factory where they were making all type of, of uh, textile productions. Then he had a store where he was selling different type of things for ladies' uh, apparel uh, and, and uh, special clothing and special things for for uh, underwear and he was I would say not very prosperous but he wasn't well off uh, we were living in an apartment which was quite nice uh, both children had bicycles which was a sign of progress at the time we had a piano my mother is a pianist uh, we had uh, reunions at home where people would come to us uh, and friends we were not very rich, but we were well off. And at the standards at that time, father was traveling a lot to different places in Europe for his business representations. Uh, I would say we would be we, we would be considered as comfortable mm -hmm. without being rich. What What was your home life like when your dad was in town when he wasn't away traveling? 
I would say it was pleasant and normal. We were always uh, happy to see him come, especially because he was bringing a, lot, bringing a lot of gifts from other countries that he would travel to. And he was a very nice person. I was a very sick child. You were sick? I had a very sick childhood. What, uh, what were your I don't know. Everything that can happen to a kid I had. I had pleuritis and I had uh, scarlet and I was uh, many, many years uh, under doctor's care. All the, all the childhood that I had, let's say between four and eight, uh, was a very serious ailment and I was many times on the verge of dying and got saved by miracles most of the time. And after that I, I was already uh, doing well and I never got sick again. Was it the same illness that you had or different illnesses between? It was a series of illnesses which apparently stemmed all from not having my tonsils removed. After they removed my tonsils, I started to be strong and sturdy and didn't have any problems anymore. So did that mean that your home life was, at that time, was spent mainly at home? Were you able to go to school? I was going to school. I was going to school, but uh, there were periods of time of several months in bed, and then I would get well again, then I would fall down again, have problems again. But uh, the, the childhood was, I would say, under all those circumstances, a happy one because uh, I had the love of my parents and uh, my uncle and, and uh, my aunt would visit us and with uh, cousins and we would go to Riga on occasions to stay there for a couple of weeks. Every year during summer vacations we would go to a little place uh, on the sea and stay there for a couple of weeks or a month. We had a nice life. Can you remember your most uh, cherished, the most cherished event of your childhood? No, I do not remember any special cherished event in my childhood. Nothing that stands out in your mind? Some event that happened, again, before the Russians invaded? No, I really do not remember anything very spectacular that remained in my mind as something unique or different. Uh, visiting my grandmother and grandfather was always a very pleasant occasion. They would pamper us a lot, but uh, nothing so outstanding as to say that was something out of the ordinary. Now you mentioned that the Russians invaded in 1940. Yes, I right. Believe. That was, uh, do you recall the exact date that was? No, I do not remember when they invaded, uh, uh, but it was 1940, probably beginnings or so. When, when did you notice that things began to change from this very pleasant life that you had led and that you just described to us? When the Russians came in, they started with certain restrictions. Already then there were certain restrictions before they came where my parents would uh, recommend to me to be a little bit careful and not, not go uh, or provoke situations because there were fights on the streets sometimes where children were attacked by uh, anti-Semitic children from other schools and they would uh, cuss us and throw things at us and we would try to fight back. And uh, my parents would tell me not to fight back and be still and try to avoid these type of things. But we children had uh, on many occasions uh, confronted these things and sometimes we came out as winners. It was a good feeling to be able to hit back. When I was nine years old, it was no big deal, but anyway, it was children of our age. Uh, when the Russians came in, apparently this anti-Semitic issue was kind of appeased because the Russians were very uh, serious about not allowing any type of discrimination. And they were telling uh, at that time that everyone is the same and everyone is uh, free and uh, all people are equal and there is no racist and no color and all this and all that, and nothing with religion which should be uh, unpleasant. And uh, if there would be some kind of a anti-Semitic thing, this person could even uh, wind up going to jail or answering for a judge. Mm. That was uh, the theory of Russia, equality for everyone, which was stemming from the French Revolution. 
uh, liberté, égalité, fraternité, which is uh, one of the standards of the Russian Revolution which they copied. But you know, not everything that is written is uh, done the way it's written in the book. So uh, after a while it wasn't the same. But at the beginning it was like that. And uh, they wanted all the children to be part of their movement and the children would walk around very happy in the streets with their red uh, scarves belonging to the pioneer group. And uh, there were clubs established and you could go to a club and see movies for free or sit and discuss. And of course, for a 10-year-old child at that time, this was interesting. It was a movement which was full of novelty and full of things which were exciting. Uh, my father had a little rough time because they took everything away from him. But as my father spoke many languages and spoke Russian fluently, he regained the position and he became a representative of workers. And again, he was managing the same factory, which was his own factory, but for the government, and he was the main manager of the factory, so he could more or less continue making more or less a decent living. Uh, that was in 1940. And in 1941, when the Germans invaded uh, Lithuania and came into Kovno, this is when I started uh, seeing many, many things from a different uh, perspective entirely and got faced with uh, very many atrocious happenings, which while, influenced me very much. While the Russians then had were in control, your life was was changed in some ways very positively and in some ways negatively. For example, you mentioned that your father's livelihood had been taken away, but at the same time it came back. Now when the when the Russians you said the Russians had retreated, is that right? Bef before the Germans invaded? When the Germans started the invasion, you know that the Russians made a pact with the Germans uh -huh. of non aggression. This is a historical fact. Molotov came and signed the papers with Hitler of non-aggression, and this uh, allowed Hitler to continue and make uh, uh, many conquerors, and while Russia, Russia was sitting passively, not doing anything, because there was a non-aggression pact between them, Hitler could gobble down Poland and take Czechoslovakia and take many countries. Mm -hmm. Russia didn't move a finger at the time. That was Stalin's politics, and he wanted it like that. That was what? Stalin's politics. Right. Okay. Joseph Stalin's politics. When uh, Hitler uh, decided that he is going now to agree or go against Russia, it was probably a surprise for Russia. So the first reaction at that time was to flee the occupied territories of uh, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, while the German forces were advancing. Uh, the Russians chose not to fight back, or if they did, it was very little that they did because they felt that they're uh, more prepared to fight the Germans back within the Russian territory where they had more established uh, patterns and more preparedness and more forts and more uh, weapons probably than in Lithuania. So their first reaction was jump into the buses and let's go. But let me tell you before that, a couple of months before that happened, the Russians made a movement of uh, sending all the bourgeois from Lithuania towards the inside of Russia and many to Siberia. Siberia. What does that mean is that uh, they've been taking people with whom they knew had connections of being owners uh, of uh, factories or industries and they would take them and their families and put them on trains or on trucks and send them back to Russia, inside of Russia where apparently their idea was to make of them good workers and not uh, bloodsuckers, which uh, apparently any person who was having a factory was to their eyes. So many of the people who they shipped by force to Russia had the big fortune to be saved from the German invasion. Uh, even if they were passing a very bad time in Russia and hunger and so on, but they did not have to face a German invader, which was much worse. 
My father, through the fact that he, as I told you before, spoke Russian, know their ways and culture, got himself appointed by them to be managing the same factory where he was owner for the Russian government, which is for the people. That entitled him to a little better salary, that also entitled him for a bit, little bit better pay to take home and more, a little bit more food. And he, at that time, was very happy not to have to move. Mm -hmm. We were looking upon all the other people who were moved towards Russia as people who were uh, disgraced by the situation or, or very deeply affected by the problem. Unfortunately, it wasn't, it wasn't like that. They were the lucky ones, and we who remained were the unlucky ones. So in 1941, June 22nd, when the Germans invaded Lithuania, uh, we were trapped, and we wanted to go, uh, maybe, or escape towards uh, Russia with the same people uh, who were going to Russia in the military uh, transports. There were, all the military was moving towards Russia. There were many trucks and, and things going towards Russia. And some civilians, through their good or bad uh, things, could jump into the truck and go there. When this was decided, and father said, let's pack and let's go with them. Maybe they will take us. So we don't have to stay here. The Germans are approaching Kovno. Uh, we started packing. and. Uh, my mother was, of course, a typical, very, very good Jewish mother and started packing everything she could put her hands on. And uh, we were schlepping pillows and, uh, and I don't know, everything. And we uh, had so much loaded on us that we could maybe walk half a block. And that was how far we escaped. And my father said, we can't that way anymore. Let us go back home because <laughs> to die in the next block holding all that would better to stay and we went back home and uh, so our escape from Lithuania and from the German invading forces was completely unsuccessful and we went back to our apartment and uh, were trapped by the situation a few hours later at night we were sitting in the bunkers with, which was uh, below their house and listening to the bombs falling and uh, next day we heard many shouts and people shouting in the street. At night it was horrible. Uh, we found some people lying dead in our street and in blood. And uh, hunger was approaching. And two days later, we had more and more hunger. And there was no way to get any food anywhere. And the porter of our house was a Lithuanian. Uh, he was a very peculiar type, but very representative of what the Lithuanians were per se. The Lithuanians, when the Russian came in, put a red band on their hand with a hammer and sickle. And when the Russians left, they just changed it on the other side and put the swastika on. And it was the same band. And they were pro-Russia when the Russians were there, and they were pro-Germans when the Germans came in. So this fellow said to me, and I was then 11 years, he says, listen, I know that you need a lot of food. You don't have anything to eat. Come, I'll show you where you can get food. We were living, I think, on the third floor. I went down there, and there was a guy uh, dead uh, lying in the garage. He says, this is a Jewish fellow. You can eat him if you want. And that was a tremendously strong impression for me. It was the first time I saw something like that. And uh, that was a moment when all the cruelty started. Could you then describe what happened to you after that first recognition that things were going to change for the worse? Things were going very bad. Uh, we had some uh, Germans who came with this fellow to our apartment and uh, knocked on the door and they were menacing us that they were going to kill us and and uh, every two, three minutes, my father would try to speak to them and appease the Germans. And, and they were completely drunk, and they were trying to put us on the wall. And they would say, now we're going to shoot you. And the porter was there. He, he brought them. He brought the Germans to our apartment. And 
it was uh, uh, in my experience of 11 years there was not much that I would understand but uh, they were very very aggressive my father would try to tell them something and try to speak to them in German they would ask them about their children whether they are children and they would take out uh, a photo and show the children and he would tell them oh, nice children this is nice children the wife is a very nice woman and yes I love my wife very much I love my children very much and but now you get to the wall Jews we're going to shoot you and again this guy, the porter, would whisper something to their ear. To make a long story short, they had us there for several hours. They took the wings away, the gold away. And finally, they took us down, and they were going to shoot us again, already below on the ground floor. And again, the porter said something to them, and they just left. Without saying a word, they just disappeared. And the porter told us, go, up, go back to your apartment. And we back, went back to our apartment, and then the porter came back, and he uh, called my father and told him that he wanted him to know why the Germans didn't kill us. And he says, they didn't kill you because I told them not to kill you. I was the one who showed them in the building to kill every one of you Jews, but I saved you because you, Mr. Lubetsky, was the only one who would give me your hand when you would help. And the fact that my father would, on occasions, bring him a little bottle of vodka or give him a little present on New Year's saved our life. So even though he'd been so cruel to you... He was human. He also had a human side. Yeah, he had a human side. He even said to him that everyone considered him like he was a beast, he was a nothing, and my father always gave him a position of a human being. And had there been other families, Jewish families, in your apartment that were killed at that time? Everyone was killed, like 16 families. Ours was the only one who survived in that building. And then the Germans started with, uh, every day you would have a different uh, message that you could hear on the radio, you would see plastered on the walls, uh, like messages or, or orders saying, uh, from now on, we would like all the Jewish population to deliver us all the metal things because we, get, we need to use them for our canyons. Whoever is not going to leave, deliver the metal things will be considered as an enemy, enemy of the Reich. And next day it was something else, and then you have to deliver your gold, and then you have to deliver the copper and the knives, and every day there was a new message on the wall what we were supposed to do, and slowly they started to uh, dehumanize us by saying that we are not allowed to walk on the sidewalk, we should walk down on the, on the side of the street where the vehicles were, and we're supposed to take off our hat if we would see a, a German, and then the next day that we have to bow in front of a German, and then we have to stand on the knees if we see a German. Every day there was a new thing. And uh, slowly they uh, were driving us towards uh, a situation where we were, didn't have any, anything anymore. There was no desire for resistance. You have to understand that this was not happening in an hour. This was happening in many, many weeks. When uh, the Germans invaded Lithuania, uh, Lithuania had two and a half million inhabitants. 175,000 were Jewish people scattered through all Lithuania, not only in the city of Kaunas, but through all Lithuania. They started immediately with enormous amount of killings because the Lithuanians themselves were very interested to be able to plunder and get all the money and all the gold or whatever the people had. And there were many, many Jewish communities, extremely poor, but they were also surrounded by very extremely poor non-Jewish people. Mm -hmm. So a pair of shoes for these people was as important as uh, some golden coins for other people. And everything was in the frame of, let's kill the Jews, we'll get their things. So everyone was going around and killing them left and right, and there were very, very few saved. It was just very, very tragic. And at the same time, they had some military forts in Lithuania in the neighborhood of Kovno. The military forts were Fort Five, seven and nine, and they would bring their 
people from all around Lithuania, villages and towns and cities, and kill the people. They would make the people dig a grave and would then make them undress and stand 1,000 people in front of the grave and they would shoot them. And then the other 1,000 were killed and again would have to cover them and shoot them. And uh, the Germans had sports uh, where the, uh, they together with the Ukrainians, the Lithuanian uh, mili militia, which were willingly helping them, because every time they could kill someone, they would get something, uh, would establish terrible, uh, horrible things and atrocities by pulling Jewish rabbis by their beards, hanging them by their beards, killing children left and right, and doing the most unimaginable and terrible things. And I used to tell this to my friends on occasion that if my mother would tell me what I know or what I've seen, I would not be, I wouldn't have been able to believe her. And this type of things were done continuously. They would take uh, especially religious people and make them eat uh, things like uh, life rats. And, uh, you have no idea. The most atrocious and terrible things. And I believe that uh, the Ukrainians and the Lithuanians were as mean or maybe even more than the Germans themselves because the Germans were uh, 20 or 30 SS guards surrounded by hundreds of the Lithuanians and Ukrainians. And the, the work, the dirty work, was usually done by the the Lithuanians and the Ukrainians who were uh, enjoying themselves like having a party. Anyway, when a month and a half later the ghetto was established in Lithuania from the 175,000 Jews that were living in Lithuania, only 39,000 remained. So you can imagine what a massacre they committed in a month and a half to 140,000 people, roughly. The ghetto was established in uh, Lithuania in a place called Viljampole. This is Viljampole is the name in Lithuanian, which was a section of the town of Kaunas. Uh, and in Yiddish it was called Slabotke. Slabotke, as I mentioned before, was the cradle of the Jewish culture. Uh, and uh, that was a section where the Jews lived. It was surrounded by barbed wire and the Jews were put in there uh, as crammed in as you can imagine uh, under very, very bad conditions. They had the Jewish police creation uh, created there and the Jewish police was trying to uh, do whatever they could as to appease a little bit the situation. They were good to us as much as they could be. Uh, there was a Jewish uh, representative group. One of them was a Dr. Greenberg. He saved himself and he's now in Israel. He's one of the most important people in the science uh, department. Dr. Greenberg uh, was trying to appease the situation also. We had very important people in the medical field, uh, in the construction field, really important group of Jewish intellectuals in Lithuania. Unfortunately, the Germans knew very well how to make their game. They would come and tell us, uh, we need 200 engineers. These engineers are going to be taken to Germany for six months and they'll get very good payment. And uh, they'll come back uh, later to join their families with money and food and all that. And the engineers would come and present themselves. Instead of 200, they would come 500. And they would take them away in buses and we found out after the war that they were killed. They would do the same thing to doctors and the same thing to architects. And they were just slowly trying to get rid of all the intellectual Jews at the beginning. Then they made, on occasions, the, they would call it Aktionen. But that was a selection, actually. Germans would come into the camp and would put us in the rows at five, 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 and somebody would stand in front and tell you this five to the right and this to the left, and sometimes you would separate the five, two to the left and three to the right, and nobody knew what right meant or left meant, and this then was, find out. This was in the ghetto? That was in the ghetto. In the ghetto. Mm -hmm. That was in the ghetto. 
and uh, nobody knew what the five meant, whether left was good or right was good, and then we would find out uh, a day later that they took a group of 10 or 12 or 15 or whatever people to the forge and killed them there. This was forts four, five, and seven. Forts five, five, seven, and nine. Five, seven, and nine. Five, seven, and nine. And, uh, They had a special selection made for children where they killed all the children which were below 13 years old. And the scenes of mothers separated for the children were gruesome and terrible. They would take the children out from under the beds where they were hiding with, with uh, walking canes and throw them in the, the air and catch them with their bayonets or shoot them. And they were doing the things the most terrible things you can imagine, but uh, Was this every time that things like that happened, they would then tell us, well, there were some wild people among us, and they are doing the atrocious things, and we were going to control them. And as far as the people that we selected, these Jewish children, are going to a place where they're going to be taken care of, they'll give food to them because they're sick children, and when they're strong enough to work, we'll bring them back. And of course, they were killed. They would always tell us lies. They would come with trucks with a red cross painted on them and tell them that this is going to be an exchange with prisoners to Switzerland. And we would uh, then see many people get into these trucks and go there. And the trucks were specially conditioned with gas inside. And they were gassed inside of the trucks. And trains with red cross exactly the same, with, which had gas inside, would gas thousands of people. And the destruction of uh, the people was continuing like in a factory. They would improve the ability of destroying us every day more and more. The ability of making us dehumanized more and more up to an extent that we did not uh, even try to fight back anymore. Many people have asked me through many years, why isn't that that we did not resist? Why didn't the Jews fight back after this condition? And I tell them that we did fight back. In the certain places like the Warsaw Ghetto, in some other places in, in Lithuania, there were some resistances made. We had some Jews which went into the partisans and fought back. But it's very difficult for people who have 150 or 250 calories a day of food to be able to fight. It is very difficult when you are brought to this stage in two, three years of continuous harassment, and of continuous uh, made to be crawl, to, to, to crawl in front of them, to be able to get up and, and fight back. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe that uh, the Jews have established proof that they are good soldiers and they are good fighters through their establishment of Israel after the war where they could prove to the whole world that they are not only good fighters, they are good workers, they are good uh, agriculture people and that they can do everything as well or better than most of the people in the world. Roman, you were um, 11 when the ghetto was established. That's correct, yes. How did you um, escape from the children's selection. You said they took all children under 13. I was always uh, a very tall, sturdy boy. Uh, I was always uh, about one head taller than the rest of my companions. And this helped me through most of these uh, selections where I would try to stand a little bit taller and, uh, I, and I don't know. But uh, for my family, because these things happen and there is no reason or there is no way to pinpoint why that happened that way. But for my family, uh, the basic family, which was mother and father and two children, the four of us survived. And we were through different concentration camps. My mother was in a different concentration camp. We were in a different concentration camp. And of all the people I know, I don't know one family like that. It's the four of us survived. Nowhere have I ever found a family that survived. And all the rest of our family 
starting from all my cousins, uncles, aunts, grandfather, grandmother, and so on, not one survived. In different places, in different cities, in different countries. Why does uh, things like that happen? I don't know. Maybe it was some special force. Maybe it's God. I don't know why. But somehow or another, you managed to survive through how many years of the ghetto now? I was in the ghetto till 1943. At the end, when the ghetto was, I think, uh, liquidated, and people were started to be taken into Germany, and, and uh, in 1943 ends or beginning 44, we went to a place called Schanzen Konzentrationslager, which was a concentration camp of Schanzen, in the vicinity of the ghetto, uh, which I mentioned before in Slabotsky or in Kavna. And this uh, concentration camp there was specially established to provide people to service a very large factory, which was making some pieces of wood from inception from the big trees, which was called Tankholz. The company was a German factory belonging to the government called Tankholz Commando. And these little pieces of wood would uh, be thrown into special ovens, which were placed on top of all their military equipment, trucks, and, and, and uh, cars, and so on, it was used instead of gas. They didn't have gas at that time. So by a special method of burning this wood, they would then capture the gas, which was going to a special carburetor, and this gas was used exactly like the gas of gasoline is used. So how many people had, had um, gone to this special factory? How many were actually left in Shanzen to go? I mean, left from the ghetto to go to Shanzen? When we uh, entered the concentration camp, uh, well, I'm sorry, when we entered the ghetto in Kaunas, we were roughly 39,000 Jewish people, which were the survivors after the month and a half of massacre, mm -hmm. made through the Germans and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. When the Germans felt that the Russians were starting to advance towards Lithuania to, uh, and reconquering territory, and that was at the end of 13, uh, 43, beginning 44, they took a large amount of the survivors of the ghetto, which already were the, f the remainder of after the, after the, the the selections they made, which were rough, uh, roughly around 18 or 19,000 people, and took about eight or 9,000 people and started sending them back to Germany, to different concentration camps. But there, among them, concentration camps which were specially designed for working, and other concentration camps which were designed for extermination. These 9,000 people were put into cattle, uh, trains, and sent to Germany. About 10,000 people, of a total of 19,000 survivors, were then sent to this Schanzen Konzentrationslager, 10 or 11,000, I don't know exactly the figures, to produce everything within the uh, frame of supplying these wood pieces for the German uh, industry in uh, in uh, exchange for gas, which they didn't have. And we stayed there for about six or seven months. Mm -hmm. Our conditions in this place were better because we were there supervised not by uh, the SS, but by the German military more than anything else. And uh, we had a little better chance to eat, a little bit better chance to get some uh, exchange occasionally something with farmers. And uh, actually, to stay there eight, nine months was uh, better than the previous months in the ghetto. Of course, they would then make little small selections inside of the concentration camp of, of uh, Shansen, which was, as I told you before, in the vicinity of Kaunas. But these selections were basically designed to take out the sick people. And it was not the selections where thousands were taken away, but a couple of hundred people. And when the Germans felt that the Russians were advancing uh, 
towards Lithuania faster and reconquering the territory, they decided to move us from there and liquidate this concentration camp of Shansen and take us by train into Germany. And we were there separated at a certain station from the women, which went to a concentration camp called Stutthof. And the rest of us, the men, went to a concentration camp called Dachau. Well, Dachau was in the interior of Germany. Bef before we get into that, Roman, could you tell us a little how conditions were better in the factory? How, how did it happen that you were able to eat a little better and trade with the farmers? Well, they were taking us uh, with many, many trucks outside of the Shansen concentration camp, first of all, to the areas where the trees were growing. Outside of the city of Kaunas, outside of the region of Shansen. And the trees would cut down, would be cut down there by the Jewish people, by the thousands of trees, and cut into pieces, loaded into big trucks and transported to the factory. Well, this has been, was, do, been, was being done uh, 50 or 100 kilometers from Kaunas. You would get across with peasants who would have farms there or their cows. And they would exchange with you and give you some bread or some milk for a pair of pants or something. And as this was a daily occasion that certain people, or certain hundreds of people of these 10,000 went to this region to cut down the woods, and other thousands would be working in the factory chopping these woods, and other loading it, and so on and so forth. These groups who would go to these places to cut had the chance to take uh, maybe an extra pair of shoes, or an extra pair of pants, or an extra underwear, and exchange it for a little bit of bread or some beans and so on and so forth. And as we were not guarded by Nazis or Ukrainians or Lithuanian militia, but we were guarded by the German uh, military forces, they were not so uh, harsh with us. And they would allow us to bring into the concentration camp of Shansen a loaf of bread or some milk or some piece of butter or something like that. So our condition there as a community of 10,000 was generally a little better. Where in the ghetto we were completely closed in and we would not get anything but what they would give us. And here we could uh, exchange something. And many times even the Germans themselves, which were in the camp getting good food, uh, as you know, in the villages, you always have much better conditions than in the cities during the war. They would get a piece of, uh, of uh, meat or would get uh, a pork and roast it, uh, would throw a leg or would throw some uh, piece of uh, meat uh, to the Jews who they liked more, with whom they were in contact, or help us more. They were in a better situation, uh, like when they were in the ghetto, and that was why remaining the six or seven months in in the Schanzer Lager was uh, probably the best part of the whole uh, five years of war, four and a half years of war. What was the work that you did in the factory? I did many things. One of the most important works I did was sewing the big trees into uh, slices, this about four inches or five inches. And then there was a special machine who would take this slice of wood this size and break them into little cubes. And the other one that I did uh, was to split the big trunks into pieces. When the big trunk would arrive and you would put it into a special conveyor which would uh, bring it to a special, especially very big axe, which would take the whole piece of tree, which was, I don't know, maybe 15 uh, or, or 10, 20 yards long, which was a section of the tree, of course. Uh, the pieces cut were 15 or 20 yards long. And then he would take it to a machine, would cut them in, in half. That would make them be like eight or seven yards long. And then this seven yards you would put to a machine who had a very big ax right, right at, the, at the part which was turning. And when you would push this big, enormous log toward this ax, the ax would split it in two. And then 
it would split it into two again, and then from these pieces, you would take to the machine which would cut them into the slices. Mm -hmm. And you were what, about 13 or 14? I was at, this time? at that time 13, 13 and a half years old, yes. Okay, can I ask, your family was all at Shonson? Your parents? I, and my what? Your family was with you at Shonson? Is that at right? this time, we were all together, yes. I see, and you were living together in Shonson? We were living together in Shonson. You had some, what were the living conditions? There were barracks. Oh, barracks. There were barracks made, uh, the conditions of living were, of course, not exciting at all, but compared to what we got later, it was a palace. So then, the later was the transportation to Dachau. Yeah, later Dachau was much worse than that. Okay, would you, would you tell us a little what, what that was like? <laughs> In 1944, about a month before the Germans had to escape Lithuania mm -hmm. and before the Russians invaded or came back to reconquer Lithuania, we were shipped on uh, cattle cars towards Germany. And as I told you, the women were separated and taken to a place called Stutov, uh, where they remained in one concentration camp. And we were taken to the interior of Germany to a place called Dachau. Let I want to mention to you that the transportation here in these cattle cars was one of the most horrible experiences that a human being can go through. Horrible experience was from the first moment that the Germans came into Lithuania. It is sometimes very difficult to be evaluating and tell you that this was worse than the other because they were all so bad mm -hmm. that it sometimes is a matter of, of feeling was it really worse or not? Because I don't know if, if the, my seeing this man dead the first time, a child of 10 or 11 years seeing a dead person sliced in pieces, offered for food to take to your mother because we're hungry, was a worse impression than uh, standing next to the wall and uh, the rifles pointing down to you where you're going to be shot, or seeing children pulled out with under, under the, the beds where they're hiding with canes are thrown into the air and caught with bayonets. How can one say what's worse than the other? They were all horrible. And therefore, the experience by going in this cattle train to Dachau was also very horrible because we were scrammed in there. Some people wanted to escape through the windows. It wasn't possible because they had bars. Uh, people were defecating and doing all their necessities right there where they were because there was no other place to go. People would die there and lie among the rest of us. And uh, we'd, we're not get, we didn't get any food, we didn't get any, any water for the next four or five days that this transportation took place. We would come to a place and stand there for I don't know how many hours. It was, Dante's Inferno was nothing compared to what we went through going in these trains. Uh, it's so difficult to be able to describe in an hour uh, the experiences of a child like I was of four and a half years of, of uh, suffering. Uh, I only am getting mad at myself. There are so many points that I could mention about people giving the diamond the way that they were hiding for a glass of water and, and uh, things like that. And, Anyway, when we came to Dachau, they addressed us all, and uh, we received our striped uniforms. And from Dachau, which was a concentration camp built in 1933 by Hitler to uh, take care of political dissidents or people who were not in agreement with him, uh, that was probably one of the first concentration camps built there, they have established 10 different departments of Dachau. I don't know if we can call them departments, but there are sections actually of Dachau. So there was a main concentration camp, Dachau, in uh, Baviera in Germany. And then there were 10 different camps called Dachau number one, Dachau number two, Dachau number three, Dachau number four. <laughs> of course, Dachau, the main camp, was built with uh, stone and, and, and uh, uh, 
brick and so on. The other dachos, one, two, three, up to ten, were built with what they called the Finnish Selten. Finnish Selten is a procedure of building uh, taken from Finland, where you take the bare ground or dirt and make a hole in it so you can lower your feet and you sleep on this uh, ground on the earth and you walk through this thing uh, which is about three feet below so it's like a little passage you walk through this passage and you lay out on the ground it's very easy to to draw it uh, you have to imagine that this is a section like this of earth then this is excavated like that and then again a section of earth so here's where you walk and here's where you sleep mm -hmm. and all this is covered with some uh, material which can be uh, anything and this is the easiest and the cheapest way of construct some shelter for you and this is where we stayed and uh, we were undressed and uh, we were given uh, striped uniforms shoes were taken away we were given some wooden shoes uh, like in Holland but of course worse and uh, that was all we had for for clothes could we uh, back up no. just a minute Mr. Lubetsky and, and at the time that you were separated from from the women and your mother you did you realize that she was going to go someplace else no we didn't know they just separated them they didn't give us any explanation and we just uh, didn't even uh, we were not even uh, allowed to say goodbye because they would just say women down women down and they would get in there with with their uh, rifles and uh, hitting people left and right and take the women throw them down and then the clo doors were closed and we nearly couldn't say even goodbye the doors were closed and the train continued that was it so your mother continued on the train after no you we continued on the train you continued they on. took they, them down they took all the women down uh -huh. and uh, we continued with the train we didn't know that we all everyone was shouting everyone was screaming and uh, we didn't know where they were going, why they were going, whether they were going to be killed, whether they were going to be working. Fortunately, after the war, we found out that she was alive. Mm -hmm. but you she was liberated before us because the Russians <coughs> invaded that territory or came to this territory before they came uh, to ours. We were liberated by the American forces. And in this place of Stutov, they were liberated by the Russian forces mm -hmm. who were advancing faster. So but she was liberated four months before me. But you and your father and your brother managed to stay together. We stayed together till the end of the war. Okay, so now we're at Dachau, and, and you're in Dachau number one, as I've... Dachau number one is where we stayed. Mm -hmm. What was going on there? I want to tell you a little episode. Sure. That, uh, when we came to Dachau number one, of course, we were told again that if we had anything to hide, we should deliver it. Otherwise, we should be... We will be shot. And... Uh, the Jewish people, mainly from Lithuania, are very stubborn people. Uh, I don't know if it is to be mentioned with pride or not, but anyway, somebody was hiding somewhere a couple of German marks and thought maybe he will be able to buy something. But when this was the situation, and we knew that there was no way to hide anything. The people had big latrines. A latrine is like a toilet. Uh, where all the feces are accumulated in big tanks. Mm -hmm. And then on uh, certain occasions, a big uh, truck comes and uh, empties that, and then you continue doing your necessities in these tanks. Anyway, the Jewish people who had a couple of marks in paper money would throw them there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know how it came to the ears of the Germans, that the, the Jewish people would throw the money into the into the feces, and they asked which were the best and the most prominent people who represent us. There was a very important Dr. Elkis, who was one of the survivors, 
and uh, they took him and uh, some doctors and engineers and undressed them completely and made them swim naked and take the money out and wash it and, and uh, dry it for them. That was the beginning of our reception. And then the commandant of the camp came out and told us that uh, this is five minutes between, before 12. We should know that two minutes before 12 we will all die. They will never allow us to get to the end of the war. Five minutes before 12 you're here, but two minutes before 12, to mean 12 is going to be the end of the war, we will take care of you all. There was a very uh, serious situation there because they took us into this camp, Dachau 1, to service an under underground factory which was going to be an airport. Apparently this airport was never finished and they are finished them and using, are using it now for the NATO forces. But this was a complete airport with ramps, with factories, and, and, and uh, you know what you need for an airport, all underground. It was a, they were going to do there something which would never be able, nobody would ever be able to bomb them. The air, airplanes were going to be taking off from a place that you wouldn't even see, and suddenly they would be in the air. <coughs> they used thousands and thousands of people, of slave work, to construct it. And all these ten camps, Dacha 1, 2, 3, up to 10, were dedicated for the construction of the airport in the different sections in different places surrounding the work which was scattered over many many miles as you can understand an airport is a very big facility uh, they would give us as food uh, around 120 grams of bread a day the 120 grams of bread which was four ounces, approximately. Half of it was uh, sawdust. It was sawdust mixed with some kind of a grain, and that was the bread that we were getting. Most of the time it was full of the green stuff, and maybe this helped us because they discovered after the war Fleming did that from this green stuff you make penicillin. But that's what we Mold. ate. Yes, mm -hmm. that's what we ate. And uh, about one and a half cups of uh, soup. And if you would see there, one uh, piece of carrot uh, swimming, you would be happy. And then we would get a cup of coffee, which was also water. And that was what we would get a day. I think calorie-wise it was like 250 calories. People were dying and starving like flies. Mind you, it was not a concentration camp designed for uh, extermination. Auschwitz was, Dachau wasn't. But they had very, very effective means of killing you by the way they fed you, and the way they hit you, and the way they treated you. So uh, people were dying in very large amounts. The whole, the whole surrounding of that was constant, constant harassment and constant moments of, of fear, constant moments of horror. The new concentration camp uh, Commandant, a German called Temple, came there and said to us that he is a person very interested in culture and he would like us to form an orchestra. So when the people go to work and come back, they should be received with an orchestra. And he took 10 or 15 people who were musicians and made them play. And there was a little boy, 12, 13 years, I knew him only from far away who would play the violin extremely well. The knowledgeable people said that if he would continue, would probably be as important as a Yasha Haifetz or Oistach, one of the geniuses in music. 
And this Commandant Temple told him he wants to hear him play, he should play for him. So I took him to a room, the child took the violin and was playing for him for I don't know how long. And uh, this Mr. Temple said that he had never heard somebody play the violin so well. And then he took his hands and with this gun broke his fingers and said, the Jewish child should never play. Okay, many things happened there, and uh, it was very difficult, it was very rough, it was very sad, friends were dying all around you, people committed suicide, <coughs> there were some people who made competition to see who is rougher and who is worse. I have to admit that we had some prisoners with us, which were very bad elements, and just for uh, the fact that they could get a little bit, little bit more bread, they would accept to be couples to take care of us, and, and uh, some of them were very good and helped us a lot. I know of one person who was the head couple, and this head couple, through his way of behaving with us, he spoke a very good German. And his way of being in contact with the Germans uh, did a fantastic labor to save us. He would appear to be a mean beast. And whenever a German would come and would be about to kill a prisoner, he would jump out and start hitting him before the German did. And he would tell him, lie down on the floor and don't move. And it would hit him for a few times, and he would remain there. And then the German, saw, seeing that he was hitting him, would go away. If he wouldn't have done it, the German would have shot him. Mm -hmm. I saved many people. But there were some who took their functions to heart as, as uh, worse than the Germans. And I know of a fellow who came there, and there were some Hungarian Jews who came to the camp. It was winter, it was snowing, and it made them address, and it made them stay outside during the whole night in the snow, and all of them, 200 people, maybe all of them died, because he was punishing like that, having made them stand hungry, f coming from a transport completely naked with 10 or 15 below, below uh, zero in, in Celsius, which is uh, probably 15 degrees Fahrenheit. The scenes were terrible, people would commit suicide <laughs> in the working conditions. The Germans, which were assessed, were very bad. Uh, there were big machines uh, turning cement and, and mixing cement, and millions of pounds of cement was being poured by tubes. And uh, if somebody dis didn't behave well, he was just thrown into this place and mixed together with the cement. Um, people would eat anything they could find. Uh, if we would be able to find a piece of carved potato, you know, the peeling of the potato, that would be fabulous. And I'm talking about uh, the potato that was sometimes spoiled. It just was a banquet. I remember that in our cell there was a doctor who said once to my father, he says, Shoma, I don't understand. How is it possible that in my life we never made some dishes with potato peels? If I'm ever going to survive. <laughs> <laughs> How did you survive? What kept you going? Um, I think my father saved my life on many occasions. He would try to get me something extra. I don't think I would have survived another week. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, when the Germans felt that they were going to uh, be losing the war, one day they decided that they have to take us out from there, maybe make 
uh, make us disappear. That was a few weeks before the end of the war. It uh, has no sense for me to tell you all a little detail more of this or that. It was so many things happening. But uh, eventually, uh, they decided they're going to liquidate this concentration camp of Dachau. They took all the people out from there and brought them back to the big concentration camp, which was the main Dachau. And from there, they were going to transport us to different places, again telling us the story to exchange us. And there were trains with the Red Cross standing there and trucks with the Red Cross. And again, they were gassing people and uh, killing them. And uh, a large group, I don't know, maybe in our case, it was like 10 or 12,000 people. But there were many, many large groups. This large group, they decided they're going to bring to the mountains of Tyrol. And it was cold at that time, very, very cold. It was April. April is usually shivering cold in Europe, especially in the mountains of Tyrol, snow and ice and all that. It is only the beginning of uh, spring starts uh, probably in the uh, ends of May. So April is very cold, especially in the mountains. And we were going there, and uh, on the side there were the Germans, the, with dogs, anyone who would fall down was shot immediately. My brother wanted to lie down on several occasions, and I was telling him, don't do that, let's go, Larry, you cannot do it, and my father also. They were pulling us and pulling us, it was my father, me, and my brother. <coughs> and finally, at night, I remember like two or three o'clock in the morning, there was a very big mountain where we climbed up, and uh, a big ravine, enormous ravine. And uh, you could just feel that you were going to go in the decline of this mountain, like in the center of the mountain. Everything was covered with snow. It was 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. You couldn't hardly see anything. It was maybe glimmering a little bit because of the snow. And we heard many, many shouts, and, and somebody was shooting. And, and my father, this was the first time when I felt that he, was lo he lost his courage. He said, this is where we're going to die. And I told him, we're not going to die. And I was trying to encourage him. Yes, my son, we are. This, this is the end. And I told him, no. And I could convince him. We went all down there. And we were standing there for, I don't know, maybe an hour. And nothing was happening. And everyone was shouting because one was looking for his brother. The other was looking for his friend. There was a lot of shouting going on and some bullets, but the bullets were probably shot in the air because nobody was killed there and nobody was shot at. And suddenly it started to snow and we sat down and I don't remember anything anymore. The only thing I remember is that I got up like seven or eight hours later. I was sitting there lying next to my father and my brother with other people covered completely with, us, with snow, maybe several feet of snow on top of us, but breathing. I believe that through the twigs of the trees, there was some air going in. And at the same time, the snow was covering us like the igloos of, of, the, of the Eskimos. We kept warm inside. And it was already daylight. It was like 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning. We could see the daylight. We opened the snow, and there was not one German. Absolutely everyone left. Mr. Mm. Lubeski, I know this, this may be very difficult for you, but you said that you felt it was your father who kept you alive yes. in the concentration camp. Yes. How did he do that? Uh, I don't know how he really do, did that. I know on certain occasions uh, things happened to me. I was carrying once a tank of, uh, of some very high explosive when I was working in, in this airport. And I was fainting, and I was falling down, and I felt somebody grabbed the tank that was exploding in a thousand pieces. It was my father. It was one time I know he saved my life because I was collapsing. He once brought me a potato. How he managed to get a potato, maybe 
He was a friend of the cook. My father spoke seven, eight languages. He was a very charming guy, would always try to keep good relations with everyone, and people would give him a hand on occasions. He would um, always manage to get a little bit easier job than others. He was very good at mathematics. He would work a couple of days in the offices, maybe in numbers. He didn't have to work so hard. And maybe some people would give him some piece of bread extra. He would bring it to me when he saw me in very bad conditions. He once traded a watch that he had hidden for a pair of shoes. I know that without these shoes, which were, again, these wooden shoes with cardboard, I would have died. And, and he got me these shoes. And, uh, that saved my life, though. Again, he just pulled me through. I don't know. What about your brother? He was a little bit better off than me. He was five years older than me. He was stronger than me. I think he... He was uh, also very, very bad when we came out, but he was a little bit better off than me. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, I was, uh, at that time, uh, going faster than he was. It was a matter of maybe I would have survived five days more and he another five days, ten days. Mm -hmm. It was not a matter of completely well and completely bad. We were all very bad, but you know, uh, sometimes when you have these things, there are some people who pull a little bit more than others. So then, this was, you're talking about this very, very bad time for you was just before you were made to march into the Tyrol Mountains. Yes, of course. The more the time advanced, the worse I was off. Mm -hmm. Because uh, every day it was worse because you, your body would... Uh, uh, I, I, I cannot describe you all the episodes that how many lice I had on my body and everyone else too. Lice. Lice, mm -hmm. lice. But they were crawling. You could see a gray mass moving like that. How many people died of typhus and I don't know how we didn't get the typhus. But I have many uh, places in my body today where you can see holes like four uncles mm -hmm. uh, which formed because of lack of uh, uh, many vitamins or things like that and I remember there were weeks I would walk around with my hands like that because I couldn't lower them because all that was full of of pus and furuncles and things. From the lice? From the lice and from uh, all type of infections that you would get. There was no possibility of cleaning yourself? We did once every six months. They would take us to a special place called the Tlausung where they would take us in and uh, give us a way to have a shower, but that was far away. We had to go to a special place for that purpose, and we were not allowed to do it every day, nor did we want to, because it was cold inside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so then you, to get back to your story of where you were, you woke up covered with snow. We woke up covered with snow. We opened the snow, and we saw that there was absolutely no one there, no Germans there guarding us, and we didn't know what to do, so uh, the elder people decided we cannot stay there because this will give you definitely death. No food, no nothing, and stay in this ravine. We have to walk out from there and go somewhere. Mm -hmm. And these eight or 10,000 people that were there with us in our group, we crawled out from this ravine, went to the highway, and went in a certain direction. We didn't know whether to go left or right, so we just chose to go somewhere. And uh, an hour or so later, we wound up that was like 8 o'clock in the morning in a little German village called Hauserdorf. Am I right? Because I always have a confusion whether it was Hauserdorf or Oberdorf. But something with Dorf, it was in Dorf, means a little village. It was Hauserdorf. I checked it with my brother. Mm -hmm. And uh, people Be saw us coming out from the highway. I imagine that. We look to them like somebody coming from the moon, all dirty with no clothes on or all those torn and the faces of concentration camp inmates with their striped suits and everyone was closing the doors on us and being afraid. But we managed to go into some places and forcing them to give us food. And uh, a few hours later, we saw suddenly many, many tanks and, and trucks coming in people shouting, well, soldiers there. And many thought, of course, these are the Germans again, going to trick us, uh, they're the liberators. Uh, 
and many were very happy. And I was among those who was very sad and I didn't believe that we were getting saved. And among, <laughs> among our liberators, the American soldiers who were Jewish, who would speak Yiddish to us, there was chewing them and food. So that was finally the moment when we felt that our burdens were over, our trouble were over. Uh, many Jews died after that because there were no experience. The forces which liberated us didn't know that we were not supposed to eat too much. Mm -hmm. So they over, overdid it and gave us food and many died from so much eating. And the many, day, many died. I remember you recall the exact date of this liberation too. Yeah, it was exactly on April 26th of 1945. When you left Dachau? When we were liberated in Hausdorf. Oh, I thought the April 26th date was when you actually left Dachau. No, Dachau. this is when we were liberated. And the war was finished on the 8th of May, a few days later. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. The 8th of May, the, there was official war finish. But, uh, you know, the war didn't finish the day that they found us. Mm -hmm. The war finished for us the day they found us. Right. But it still yeah. continued. Mm -hmm. Then what happened to you? When well, you then... You were found, left, you were liberated. Then we were taken to a place called Bad Tölzen. Bad Tölzen was a special uh, place where uh, many German high officers would go for vacations, like for a rest period, like when you go to a very nice place to resort and stay there for a couple of days or a week or so. That was one of the chosen places of Hitler. And uh, the first place that he took us it was to this place and tried to give us some food and tried to give us some rest. And the people did the many, many things. There they found millions and millions and millions of German marks in safety boxes and so on. And they made enormous fires at night with the German marks because nobody thought this money is going to be worth a penny. And one fellow I know who uh, put this money into a little suitcase said, I can always, I always have time to burn it. <laughs> and sure enough, two months later, they exchanged it for good money and he became a millionaire from one day to the other. <laughs> <laughs> then they took us to a place, our group, to a place called Santo Tilian. Santo Tilian was a monastery converted into a, to a hospital where they were holding us for six or seven months, giving us all type of injections. American forces were very nice with us and giving us injections of type, different type of vitamins and, and uh, many of us recovered well. I, I recovered probably too well. <laughs> but uh, when I came into this place, I was six feet tall and I weighed around 32 kilos, which is around 70 pounds. That's why I tell you that I wouldn't have survived another week, maybe eight days more. And then uh, we applied for papers. I went to, I stayed there for about a year and we went to Berlin with my uh, my, I went to Berlin with, where my brother was very active because he started working with the American forces and he organized very important things in the tracing field and he was working with the United uh, uh, Joint Distribution Committee which were tracing lost relatives. Mm -hmm. He was working with the Americans, he was in Czechoslovakia, then he went to Berlin, organized the tracing office there and found thousands and thousands of people who were separated fathers from mothers and mothers from children and this and that. He f could find them and bring them together. And uh, I went to stay with him in Berlin in 47 at the beginning and in 47 in around July I went to Paris where I were united with my father, stayed there for two months. And in 1947, September, I immigrated to Mexico where my relatives my uncle and my aunt sent us papers. When did you find out that your mother had survived? 
This is a long, long story. My mother survived. I found out about it uh, around a month or two after we got liberated. But she already was liberated four months or five months before us. So when she was liberated, she thought that she would go back to the city of Kovna, where we were. And we didn't want to go back to the Russians. So when she found out that we are liberated in the American zone, that was six months after she was liberated, she wanted to join us, which was, of course, the North natural thing to do. But at that time, she couldn't leave Russia anymore because they would not allow anyone from Lithuania to go to Russia because they considered that Lithuania was part of Russia. So the only way to leave would be to go to a place like Poland being a Polish citizen. And she had a cousin of hers, which was a Polish citizen, and she decided that they're going to marry fictitiously so she can go to Poland and from Poland join us uh, in the area where we were. And she did that, and when they crossed the border, he asked the cousin whether he had anything to declare. He said no, and they made him take his boots off, and he found he had 10 golden rubles, and he put him five years to jail. And her, as his complice, he put one year to jail. She didn't know anything. So she wound up, after four and a half or five years in concentration camp, still to stay one year more in a Russian prison. And when she would, went out of the prison, then she couldn't leave Russia anymore, and she got herself a job. She's a musician, she's a pianist, and she became a director of the conservatory in Lithuania and stayed there till 1955 when she finally received from Malenkov the visa number two to leave Russia and reunite herself with her family in Mexico. And she came to Mexico in 1955 after 12 years of separation. Mm -hmm. How did you discover, or how did your father happen to go to Paris? My father was going to Paris because we knew already that we were going to go to Mexico. The way of going from Germany to Mexico was always through some country of the victors. Germany was the country of the losers. There was no transportation from Germany somewhere else. If you had to go to the States, you would go via France or you would go via England or something like that. So when uh, we decided we were going to Mexico and our papers were sent to Paris for process to be able to immigrate to Mexico, and I was at that time with my brother in Berlin, when he knew that everything is about to be ready, he wrote to me and he said, I'm going to Paris to process the papers with the American and Mexican consulate. You come and join me there. And I went from Berlin to Paris and he was there and we stayed there for six, seven, eight weeks. And after two months, when our papers were ready, we left to Mexico. Could you tell us a little bit what life was like at St. Ottilian? Life in St. Ottilian, after all that we went through, was pleasant. It was good. We got good food. We received rations. Some uh, committee organized for clothing. We got some used clothes that we could put on. We started functioning like human beings there. How so did you occupy yourself during the day? I was working for the Santotilian guards. Uh, they had organized among the young people uh, something like uh, some kind of a police where we were going to, to take care of the people or, or the displaced persons there that they should not be attacked by Germans. As you understand, the war finished, but there were still many, many Germans not happy with the outcome of the war and would try to attack and counterattack and, and invade and shoot and do killings to people who were there at the time. So we had to make some kind of a force not to allow them to get into this uh, monastery. And there were in many places certain concentrations of them. So by having our presence there, they were discouraged not to come in because they would come in and make killings, and they did in several places. They didn't change from, from devils to sweet uh, human beings the next day. They continued being Nazis and, 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 and bad people and 
uh, were not happy with the outcome and they wanted to revenge and things like that. So even though you were just about 15 or so? Yes, but I was a strong 15. I recovered very fast and, and uh, I was not a very... Uh, I was not a very weak, weak child after six months of recovery. Mm -hmm. I was a strong man at that time already. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so then you went to visit your your brother in Berlin, mm -hmm. and how did how did finally your mother? How did you find out that your mother? What was the process? There were lists alive? published. Uh, the lists were published through different medias. And uh, it was very difficult to find out who was saved, when and where, especially in the Russian zone. It was very difficult to find out because there was no communication between the American forces and the Russian forces. Mm -hmm. Even if there was some kind of understanding that there were allies in the war, once the war finished, the Russians was not, were not readily giving out information, nor would they readily allow you for their citizen to go out from Russia to go to other places. So my brother, as I told you, was with the American forces and he came to Berlin and he established there a tracing office. Mm -hmm. And they had certain people who were functioning, Jewish people, as secret agents who with the danger of their life would go into the Russian zone subreptitiously to find out in document centers of the survivors who were there what Jewish people were there, what were they doing, where, where they were locating, where they were located, and so on. And this information they would bring back then to Berlin and deliver to my brother. We had an office like of, I don't know, 80 or 100 people. Mm -hmm. And this information was then uh, jived or, or, or crossed through with the other information where somebody would say, I have, I have a brother who is more or less in this, in this age, we are from such and such a village. I was separated from him in this and this place. Uh, that's his name and this and that. And if they would find that this fellow with this name is uh, in some place located, they would then tell him, listen, your brother lives in such a city and your brother lives in this city. Write each other and find yourself and if we cannot, we'll maybe we'll bring them to you. And they, on many occasions, brought people out from uh, the hiding in Russia and bring them to a border and Berlin, as you know, was part Russian zone, mm -hmm. so they would be able to get into the Berlin to the Russian zone, and then by bribing certain people, they would bring them from the Russian zone to the American zone in Berlin, and then they would get together with their family. Mm -hmm. uh, my father, my brother found out about my mother, that she's a survivor, and she was staying in such and such a place in Lithuania. And with my mother, his uh, fiancé was together with her, because... Uh, all this time through the ghetto when there was, uh, I told you at the beginning in the ghetto, they were eliminating people by calling them and calling the professionals, doctors and so on and so forth and taking them out. They had one of the selections were for, they needed to have 2,000 people to go to Latvia, to Riga, to work there. My brother had a fiance with him. He loved her very much and uh, her family and she were chosen to go to Riga, to Latvia. And they had to go. And my father went to see the parents of this girl. And they told them that uh, the children were in love. Larry was in love with Riva, that was her name. And uh, that he would want Riva to stay with us, if, even if they had to go to Riga that he would adapt to Riva like a daughter or treat her with like a daughter and not to separate them. And they decided that this was the best way to do and left the girl with us. So she was with us and all the time through the ghetto and the Schanzer uh, Lager, the Kassel Schanzen. And when we were taken to Germany, she was in the transport together with my mother uh -huh. And when she was, my mother was pulled off to go to Stutov, she, this girl, went together with my mother mm -hmm. and stayed till the end of the war with my mother and was liberated in the same place by the Russians, went back with her to Lithuania. And when they advised uh, that we survived, Riva 
decided to go to Berlin and could go through with no problems, mm -hmm. where my mother was detained because the cousin she fictitiously mm -hmm. married told them a lie with that he didn't have anything. So Riva came to Berlin and married Larry in Berlin. Oh, at least that was a happy ending, wasn't it? Well, we'll, we'll talk about we'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> at the time, it was a happy ending. What, um, to what time is our interview? I see it's already too long. We have a little bit more. Well, because we started late, we still have a little more time for our interview. So you, you went to Paris. I was, trying to, I was trying to keep within the frame of two hours. Yeah, that's, we still have more time. Okay, you want me to start again somewhere? No, it's okay. Well, we're, we're close to the end. So um, you went to Paris, you met your father there, and from there you went to? To Mexico. Mexico? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was it. Of course, we stopped for a few days in New York before going to Mexico because I have a cousin of mine who at that time lived in New York, so we stayed with him for a week. And then we went to Mexico. Mm -hmm. On our way to Mexico, the plane stopped shortly in the city of Tampico. That was the first entry place in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was 1947. And and my wife at that time was in Tampico. Mm -hmm. My wife that you met before, mm -hmm. she was a very old girl at that time. She was, in 1947, four years old. <laughs> and you met her then? No. No. <laughs> no. no. I'm just proving to you how destiny works. The first place, the place stops by going to Mexico is Tampico. And this is where my bride is I being see. raised. She's four years old, and we meet many, many years later. I see. And from Tampico, you flew to? It stayed there for half an hour, then we continued to Mexico City. Mexico City. And that's where you, you settled? That's where we settled, and we were received the airport by my uncles and my cousins and all that. So you had family there to receive? Oh, yes. Uh, the papers were made by my uncle and my aunt. And she had her family, and he had his family, so it was immediately as I said, came to Mexico, we had immediately there, uh, I had already four, four cousins prepared for me, two from one side and two from the other, so okay. I had family. And you, did, did Larry come with you at that time? No, Larry didn't leave Berlin. When we left, when I left Berlin and went to Paris, Larry remained in Berlin with his tracing office and worked there for, I think, half a year or a year more. And in 1948, beginning, he moved with his wife, Riva, to Israel, where he participated in the Liberation War and stayed in Israel for several years, and then moved to Canada, where he stayed a year, and in 1952 came and joined us in Mexico and went into the same business with my father and with me. Mm -hmm. And then we worked for three years, and finally in 55, my mother came. How did she manage to finally leave? Oh, it was uh, very difficult because uh, we had to send many requests to the Russian government and, and ask them for for her to leave. And she herself was, every time she would go and ask or plead in front of the Russian authorities to let her go to get reunited with her family in Mexico, was playing uh, with her life. It wasn't easy to come to uh, the Russian government and I tell them, I want to leave your country. Mm -hmm. You were really putting a, a big bet against your life on, on, on the chessboard. It was very, very dangerous. But somehow they understood that they let her go. She had visa number two. I think she was the second person officially to leave Soviet Russia in 1955. Yeah. I don't know whether she was visa number two of all the people who left Russia officially, or she was number two in the, 50, in the year of 1955. One way or the other, it was a very spectacular situation mm -hmm. to be able to live there officially. Roman, you know, just before the war ended, did you think it would ever end? You know, the most important thing of a Jewish prisoner, probably of all the prisoners, was always the hope 
that uh, you had with you, because you had nothing else left but hope. The only thing that could maintain you is hope, maybe tomorrow, maybe in an hour, maybe in a day. So uh, the feeling that the war is going to end and we are going to be liberated was, I don't think, wasn't there. I don't think that we were capable to think like human beings. I think we were thinking like animals. We were, we were animals. They made us be animals. We would look through garbage, we would eat garbage, we would behave like animals. We would be ready to kill for a piece of bread. I don't think there was a logical way of being able to say two and two are four. You didn't rationalize. We maybe felt that there was a route of escape or that we would be able to escape somehow or maybe prolong through another piece of potato or another piece of bread our existence for a day or two and then would worry for the next day or two. There was not, I think, a pattern of thinking now because they took us to Germany and because the Russians are advancing. Now, if I look at the map and there are so many miles away, then I can probably figure out that I will be able to survive if I do this or do that. Nothing was done like that. It was just a matter of trying to crawl into a hole like, uh, like a little beast who is afraid to be eaten by a cat or be eaten by a lion or whatever and sit there and shake and hope that the lion will go away and then I jump out and grab something to eat and go another hole again. That was the type of, of, of uh, evolution or thoughts that I think went through the heads of most of my companions. So nobody thought about survival uh, or, or liberation. Mm -hmm. Survival, yes, but liberation, no. Everyone thought, how do I get a pair of shoes? How do I cover myself with something which is warmer than what I have? Or how can I fill my stomach because I'm dying for hunger? People would eat <coughs> knowingly. There was some fruit called Tolkirschen. <coughs> These are cherries. They call them the crazy cherries. If you eat these cherries, you die from them. Through tremendous agony. That you cannot get, you do not survive because they're venomous cherries. And I worked at that time uh, for a few days in a little hospital, which was a military hospital inside of the mall commander where they were doing the airport. Uh, and people would uh, come there and die 10, 20 a day because they went through the bush and they found the, the, the cherries and they knew they were going to die from eating them and they would eat them anyway because they couldn't stand it anymore. They just couldn't sense us, see something like that and not eat it. So knowing that they were going to die to tremendous excruciating pain, they would still eat this Turkish the, the crazy cherries. And this is what was happening all the time. Um, it's very difficult to give this type of... Did you ever have any thoughts about life outside the concentration camp? If you were, you know, you were so busy concentrating on survival on a day-to-day -day basis? When we were walking, uh, when they were taking us to the Tirol Mountain, we saw, because we were walking day and night, it was like four days of March or five days of March, we saw many civilians when we were crossing their villages by the thousands, standing and looking at us, watching us, observing us. And we knew that these people were leading a different type of life. We knew that they were well-dressed, more or less better fed than we were, and uh, they were looking at us like uh, when you go and see somebody in a zoological garden. You don't see uh, something normal, you see something special. That's the way they were looking at us. There were nobody there on the route offering us uh, some water or a piece of fruit or, or a piece of bread, nothing. They, they was observing us. And we felt what we were. We felt that we were animals, that we were something that we didn't belong to this society. And I don't think there was one who would think at this moment, I would like to have a dress like that, or I would have, like to have a jacket like that, or I would have, like to have the hair like this man is having. There was no, no feeling of that type of, uh, at all. We were totally dehumanized. I remember that uh, 
my reaction uh, in San Dottilian, and I was still a weakling at that time, maybe a month after I was liberated, somebody made a joke on my father, and I think that he insulted my father by calling him something or, or doing something to my father. And I grabbed the knife and I was going to kill this man. And I didn't have absolutely no remorse, nor before nor after. I was reacting like an animal. And if they wouldn't have twisted me, I would have killed him. I don't know what would happen later, but I was going to kill him. So it was, uh, it was very difficult to, you know that when I finished the concentration camp, uh, and I was 15 at the time, I never went to school again. Uh, my last day in school was when the Russians were there in 1940. And all I learned through the life was uh, by auto-education. I got a hold of many books. I started reading them. I started taking a train from San Dottilia to go every weekend to Munich to go to the opera and to concerts. And I speak eight languages and I converse fluently in, uh, in, in them. Not only do I speak, I write several and I read you know, most of them. Uh, I have a very active business life and I've learned it by myself. You I've also never, have a family yourself now. But uh, the, I'm, a, I'm a, an autodidact, as they call a self self-educated person. But I didn't go to any formal school. Do you think that was a that was a result of the concentration camp experience. You decided not to have formal education after I, that. I was not to decide or not. I didn't have any means. It was not a matter of my deciding. We came to Mexico. We didn't have any means at all. And my mother would, my father would get a small amount of money for his first needs, like cigarettes and so on. And I had to work two shifts a day to be able to eat. It wasn't easy to, to, to come to Mexico. My parents were not, my relatives were not very rich people at the time. It took me a very big amount of time to get on my feet. Mm -hmm. And uh, father, of course, helped me again in every sense and taught me as much as he could. And I was successful, mainly because I think I, was, I had to struggle and I had no other way out. It was a matter of survival like the camp was or like everything else was. How do you think the whole experience of the war that you went through. How do you think it changed you? I have certain standards. First of all, I am not a religious person. I do not believe that the establishment higher up is exactly like the Bible or the rabbis tell me. But I do believe that there must be some order. I do believe there is some higher force than me. So I believe that there is a God, but the God is not exactly like they tell me. He's not precisely sitting there worrying about me or you or somebody else, but it is an order. It's a thing within a certain order, but not precisely that if I'm going to drink uh, something or eat something, he's going to punish me, whether it's pork or not, or this type of things. So I have uh, kind of arranged this uh, religious feelings that accommodate me well. I do not feel or think that I'm afraid of dying. I think that I've been living many, many hours over, over time since 1945. Everything was extra. So I don't think that if I would know that I have to die uh, in a week or in a month, I would be terribly afraid or worried. Maybe I would be. I haven't been told yet, but I don't think I would be very worried. I think that people should be nice and good to each other. I think that uh, I have learned through my experience that in this big abyss of darkness, I found a couple of good things. I found good Germans. I found good Lithuanians. Within the whole context of all these murderers, there were good people too. 
There were people who would endanger their life to help us and save us. I told you about Dr. Greenberg, who was very prominent and is, if he's still alive, a very prominent Jewish person from Lithuanian uh, surroundings or Kovno or whatever. And he had a little boy, three years old, and uh, a Lithuanian took him and uh, hid him. And Dr. Greenberg went through all these things in the concentration camp and Dachau with me and went to Israel. And uh, when he heard once uh, Dr. Greenberg's voice on the radio speaking Lithuanian to the Lithuanian population from Israel, he did recognize that this was his friend and came to Israel, gave him to sat back. And how many years later was that? 18, 15, I don't know. Uh, if you go to Yad Vashem in Israel and you walk through there, you will see the woods of the righteous. And you will see trees for Germans and for, for Lithuanians and from, for Romanians and all kinds of people who were dedicating their life to help Jewish people. We don't have to forget that either. We do not have to do the same thing that what they did. They said that all the Jews are bad. We don't have to say all the Germans are bad. We have to know that there were a few which were not bad. And we cannot say that Mozart was bad, right? We cannot... Uh, I'm not here to... to... Uh, absolve them. But I will also not accuse all of them. There is... Uh, something very difficult to to be able to establish a comfortable pattern. But you have to do it because you have to live, you have children, you want to educate them, you want to give them as much as you can. So you try to, you try to take out the context from your life and experiences and, and uh, give of yourself as much as you can for the benefit of people who surround you. You sometimes do very silly things, and you sometimes do very bad things, and sometimes you offend easily. Because you went through many things, and, and it's very difficult to be agreeable and accept everything with a smile, you sometimes rebel yourself. We wouldn't be human if we would not be human. Either we're angels or we're human. You've given us many memories that you've shared with us. What do you think is most alive to you now? What do you remember the most about the whole experience? I don't think that I have any special thing that I can pinpoint more than others. It is, I think very fortunate in me that I can speak about it. I have many friends of mine who don't even want to speak about these things or experiences. Uh, maybe because I was so young, I could, uh, for many years, uh, eliminate it or, 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 or erase it from my memory. I was, I think after the thing and when I came to Mexico, I was functioning like a very normal or maybe I'm wrong, but I think I was functioning like a normal young man. And uh, I went to several places where I was uh, able to receive experiences uh, uh, through people with whom I was connected. I was in a Masonic Lodge, for instance, and most of them were young people there, 21, 22, 23 many professionals, I could learn a little bit about medicine through their conferences, and uh, engineers would give us conferences about engineering fields and architects about and I could learn, I could absorb certain things, and I was, loved classical music three years after coming to Mexico, or four years after, I already, without taking one class of Spanish, would write in Spanish articles in the musical uh, interviews in magazines and so on. And uh, I was an impresario, I brought from South Europe the very biggest enterprising uh, 
shows that you could imagine of, like all that Saul York would bring to New York, would afterwards bring to New to Mexico. Among that, we had the Bolshoi Bolet on several occasions, and David Deutschreich and Gillels and things. Mm -hmm. So I think that within the context of uh, everything, I should be grateful to this force who gave me the opportunity to regain things. And I would, as a message to my Jewish people, whom I love very much, even if I'm not religious, I'm very traditionalistic. If there is a message to be said, I would tell them, never allow this to happen again. Never go down from the street or take your head off. Don't let this happen again. Don't let anyone tell you that you have to take off your head in front of a German. Don't accept things readily and don't tell your children what I've been told. Don't look for fights. If you have to face something, go and face it. And don't allow these things to happen anymore. We are human beings. We should be proud of what we are. We should fight for it. Roman, you certainly have made me feel proud to even be acquainted with you. I'd like you to just fill us in now about your current family situation. I have uh, the fortune of a very good wife. She's much younger than me. She, maybe that is one of the reasons why she keeps me going. We have four children. I have a daughter of 20, and she's studying in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She wants to study humanities. I'm proud of her. I'm very proud of my son, Daniel, who is studying in the Trinity, Trinity University. Uh, he's 19, turned 19 two months ago. I'm proud that he could do two years in one. Everyone told him that he will not be able to do it because he's from Mexico. It's going to be very difficult, but he could make two years in one in Lee High School went into Trinity, is very active in Trinity, and uh, is one of the 11 senators in the Trinity High School, 19-year-old boy. I have a sweet 17-year-old girl. I think she's, everything she does, she does very graciously. She's very talented. She paints well when she wants to, and she sings with a beautiful voice, and she dances well. But all this is when she, when she wants to. And to make her want to is the difficult part. That's where my wife and me are struggling. We'll know that she will do these things. And then I have a 15-year-old boy who is a very bright boy, too. So I'm very fortunate. My 15-year-old is named after my father. And I think, I think he's doing a wonderful job. Four of them are great kids. One of the most, most satisfying things for me is that my wife and me have educated them to be very warm children. So we are not ashamed to kiss each other anywhere, anytime. And your father? My father passed away in 72. There was a section in the Reader's Digest called the most important person, do you remember? Yes. If you ever read the Reader's Digest, every month they would publish the most important person, person I ever met. I never wrote about him, but he was the most important person for me. And your mother? My mother is still alive. She is in Mexico City. She is uh, an elderly woman, complaining about herself and about her health, but 80-some years old and doing well, I think. And our biggest discussion now is to know whether she's 85 or 87 because she wants to be two years younger. The papers say that she's 87, but she says that the papers were done wrongly because she would marry my father. I don't know what kind of a team she's making. She's proving to me that she's three years younger. Let her live to 120. Amen. And what about your brother? My brother is fine. He's, He's still very, in very... City? He lives in Mexico City with his family. He's okay. You Very came, interesting person. You came here two years ago, right? Three years ago. Three years ago. And so now we're fortunate to have you living here in San Antonio, I think. That's a big question mark. <laughs> Not to me. 
Thank well, you very much. Well, Roman, I think we've, we've had a, a wonderful interview with you and certainly been extremely touching and moving as well as informative. And thank we you. want to thank you for your participation. I have a very special thing for you as a surprise. Yes. And you know what it's going to be. When we finish this, I'm going to show you the picture oh, of my children. Great. <laughs> Wonderful. Looking forward to you, it. You know the story of this old woman who's going in the park, and she approaches her grandmother, and the grandmother is pulling a carriage with a little baby. She says, oh, is this your grandchild? What a beautiful child. And grandmother says, you should see the picture. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll look forward to it. Thank you again so okay, much. Okay, you're Thank welcome. You so much. Thank you.